Good morning, church. Good to see you all today. Let's uh, stand up and let's praise the Lord together. It's going to be a new song, so hope you guys like it.
morning, church. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We give you all the honor, glory, and praise. We thank you for the opportunity for us to come together in fellowship for the for the reading and the study of your word, Lord. Open up our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us today, Lord. We are a living testimony to the work that you are doing in us and through us to others, Lord. May we continue to be faithful according to your word and to the calling that you've placed on our life and as the spirit leads us day to day. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me as we greet one another.
Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship. I'm Pastor Ray. We're so glad that you are uh, joined us today uh, to worship Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And if today's your first time here with us, we extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad uh, God brought you our way today. I'm going to share a couple of announcements with you, but while I'm doing that, if you would look for this green registration pad, it should be along the inside aisle of each pew. If you're sitting next to that, just please sign your name in, pass it down to the next person that we might get a record of each one's attendance. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, YSF, our Young Singles and Families group, is uh, meeting today, and so if you fall into that category, you're invited. And uh, it'll be uh, not here at the church today. It'll be at uh, the Bojan household, Pierre and Kay's house at 1 p.m. Uh, raise your hands over there, guys, so they know who to look to. If you don't know where to go, talk to them. They'll tell you where they live. So, very good. That's 1 o'clock today. Uh, Saturday is the last Saturday of the month. So that means men's breakfast. All the men in the church are invited. A great time of food and fellowship, Saturday morning, 8 a.m. This Saturday, our, our spring semester of grief share uh, also begins. And so if either you or someone you know could benefit uh, uh, from this group, it's a wonderful uh, support group, uh, please pick up a brochure at the table. Or if you're coming, just sign in. And I said, we'll know that you're coming. We'll have all the materials ready for you. That's this Saturday. It starts 10.30 a.m. Uh, in the uh, FAR building, in the Fellowship Hall side of that. Uh, new members class is coming up first Sunday in March, March 3rd. I've noticed a number of you uh, have already signed up for that. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of this class, this is for anybody who either wants to become a member at our church or if you just want to learn more about the church. Uh, this is the perfect class to come to. So just sign up. We'll have lunch for you, and uh, we'll take some time and just share uh, about the church with you uh, so that you can make a decision about membership. Um, and then uh, just uh, one last thing uh, out at the uh, table where people have been signing up directory information. Uh, the last thing we need is some of you, we need photos. We either have no photo or we have an old photo. And so uh, uh, if you want an updated photo for the directory, we are having a, a photo shoot here, professional photographer here, uh, Wednesday night from 6 p.m. to 7.30. And uh, so you get a professional photo for yourself, for your family, but also for the directory. And I know some of you are still holding on to that photo where you were 20 years younger, and it's like, really? I gotta like, you look great just the way you are. So make sure you uh, sign up and come out for your photo Wednesday night as well. Uh, that's all of our announcements. So if you'll turn to our, our scripture reading this morning, it comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 15, and verses 25 and 26, page 69 in your pew Bibles. Good morning. The word of the Lord. Okay. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord our, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring on any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. The word of the Lord.
And, um, you know, this time, uh, this time in the service, we always pray for one of our missionaries or mission projects that we support. And uh, this week, our prayer focus is Sheridan House. Sheridan House is a wonderful local ministry. Uh, they minister to families and children uh, uh, that are going through difficult times, uh, going through troubled times, and uh, they do a wonderful job with that. So if you can be remembering Sheridan House in your personal times of prayer this week, I know they would appreciate that. Also, before we go to prayer, there's an insert in your worship guide. There's two. There's the, uh, the outline. I'd like you to take this one out. It's got uh, Bible verses on it, Bible memory, spring 2024. Uh, every spring and fall, we try to do uh, a segment of Bible memory in church where we uh, take some verses either on a topic or, or the section of Scripture that we're studying, 
And, uh, and we memorize scripture. Uh, it's something God tells us to do, to lay up his word in our heart. And seeing we're studying Acts chapter, uh, chapters 1 through 8 this spring, I thought it would be good to just do a, take some of the biggest verses from uh, those chapters. And so I've, I've picked out five passages. And just to show you how this works, if you flip to the side where you can actually read the verse, not the little letters, I'll show you those in a minute, you'll see that our first one is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That's actually our, our theme verse for the whole book of Acts. Let's just read that one out loud together. Ready? Let's read that out loud. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there's the verse where you can memorize it out of your own Bible. If you flip it over, you'll see our schedule, and you'll see that uh, we're going to try to memorize Acts 1-8 by next week. Next week is February 25th. So we've got one week to memorize that one, and then you'll see the rest of the schedule laid out. We get a big break between March and uh, April because of Easter. Uh, and then you've got the first letter helps. And this is how I like to memorize scripture. As I write down the first letter of each word in the verse, and I kind of use that to cheat at first, but what, I, what that does is it sort of reinforces it, and then I can sort of put it away, and all of a sudden, hey, I know this. So let me show you how that works. Flip it over again, and let's just read that first phrase all the way up to the uh, semicolon there. The Holy Spirit comes on you. Let's just read that out loud together. Here you go. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Read it again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Read it a third time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now you flip the page, and you've got the first letter of each word. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Do it again, just look at the first letters. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. One more time, look at the first letters. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now don't look at the sheet. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It's like magic, it's the easiest way to memorize. It's only Sunday, and you're one-third of the way through this verse, so we can all do this, right? So, uh, you know, sit, put, take this home with you, put it in a place where you'll see it, like in your Bible, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, work on this verse this week, and use the first letters, and next week, let's, uh, let's all try to have that first verse memorized uh, as part of our Bible memory this spring. Let's go to the Lord together now in prayer. Well, dear God, we do thank you for your word, and uh, we thank you for the privilege of storing up your word in our hearts. God, we never know when you're going to take that verse that we've memorized and bring it to our hearts and minds uh, to help us through a, a problem that we're going through or, or, or to, to help someone else with something they're going through. And so, Lord, help us to lay up your word in our heart. It's how you change us. It's how you renew our minds and draw us closer to yourself. And uh, Lord, as we come to you in prayer now, we do want to lift up our church family to you. We pray for each person, each need. We pray particularly for Janet Graham, who's uh, uh, undergoing tests right now. We pray for Janet, Lord. Uh, she really needs your power in her life. We pray for your power and your healing uh, for Janet. Uh, we pray for Glenda DeGraff, Lord, uh, suffering from a broken arm and wrist. Uh, and uh, Lord, we just pray that you would speed her healing and uh, relieve her of pain. We continue praying for Robin Reese and her shoulder, for Zach Larkins and uh, his hip. And uh, Lord, we pray for our missionary this week. We pray for uh, Sheridan House. We pray for Bob Barnes. We pray for all of the leadership and administration. Uh, we pray for the counselors. We pray for the house parents. And of course, Lord, we pray for each family and child that goes there seeking help. Uh, Lord, may they find the love and care uh, of, of, of Christian counselors. And may they find the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Uh, to help them through their situation. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, if you please take your Bibles and turn with me now to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 3 this morning, verses 1 through 10. Our message series is called the Church on the Move, and we're looking at the early church in Acts, and uh, just so that we can learn how we can be a church on the move with the gospel. You know, so far in the book of Acts, we've just done the first two chapters, so far everything's worked out great for them. I mean, it's been amazing, right? You know, they went back to Jerusalem and waited for the Holy Spirit just as Jesus told them to. Then God sent the promised Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Peter preached the gospel. 3,000 people were saved. 
Uh, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to worship, to prayer. Uh, they met daily in the the temple courts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added daily uh, to their number those who were being saved. And, you know, you just read all that. You almost expect the next line to read, and they lived happily ever after. Right? I mean, it really feels that way. Everything is just going so good. But when you turn the page, okay, from chapter 2 to chapter 3, the church encounters something new. And it's in chapters 3 through 5 of Acts that we first begin to see opposition to the gospel from the people in Jerusalem. Gospel proclamation will always face opposition. And that's one of the reasons why we need the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to be witnesses for Christ, right? Because we are going to face opposition. What's sad about this opposition is that it was in response to the healing of a crippled man. And you would think no one would object to a man being healed, right? But you see, when you bring Jesus into the situation, watch out. When you bring Jesus into the situation, good things are going to happen. But yeah, you're going to see opposition as well. So we're in Acts chapter 3, and I'm just going to read verses 6 through 8 as we get started. Would you please stand with me for the reading? Of God's word. <clears throat> then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, as we look at these verses and the verses surrounding them, as we look at this wonderful healing story in the book of Acts, I pray, God, that we would not only enter into the excitement of that day uh, there when this happened, but we would see how these things uh, apply to our lives today and the good things that you have for us in your son Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, I, I told Kay, our office manager, I was going to do this this morning, so she's counting on this, okay? Here we go. Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He held out his palms and he asked for some alms. And this is what Peter did say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Yeah! Told you, Kay. <laughs> I love that song. We used to sing that in youth group. And, of course, you know, you'd get everybody to stand up. And we got to the walking and leaping in part. You know, we'd all go, and they went walking and leaping and praising God. Right? Walking and leaping and praising God. And, ah, uh, just so much fun. I love that song. I love this story. This is one of my favorite healing miracles in all of Scripture. And uh, that song, just, for me, it just captures the fun and the joy of this miracle so beautifully. There is healing in the name of Jesus, and that should fill our hearts with joy. And so we're going to uh, look at this miracle together. There's an, uh, an outline in your worship guide. I encourage you to take that out. It'll help you to follow along with the message. And uh, the whole miracle begins with the beggar, right? The beggar at the gate. Look at verses 1 through 1 and 2 now as we get started. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So we've got Peter and John, the, uh, the, the two foremost of all the apostles, 
Uh, Peter figures prominently in the, the whole first half of the book of Acts. We, we already saw him in action as the spokesman for the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Uh, he was the preacher of the first sermon after the Holy Spirit was given. And now we see Peter and John, they're going up to the temple. It's time of prayer, three in the afternoon. There are actually three set times of prayer at the temple. We've got morning, afternoon, and evening. You also had two lambs that were sacrificed each day, one at the morning sacrifice, the other at the evening sacrifice. Let me lay out how it all worked out for you, the schedule here. First lamb was brought out and tied to the altar uh, at dawn, and then it was stayed there until nine in the morning. At nine, uh, the morning sacrifice took place. This coincided with the first hour of prayer. This is also when the gates of the temple were opened for the day. So now the temple is open, first hour of prayer, sacrifice of the first lamb. Second lamb was brought out and tied to the altar at noon. This coincided with the second hour of prayer. And then the evening sacrifice of that lamb took place at 3 p.m., 3 in the afternoon, and that was the third hour of prayer. If you're paying attention, you notice it's like, well, wait a second. The evening sacrifice took place at 3 in the afternoon. What's up with that? Well, you got to remember the next day for the Jews begins when? At sundown. So, you know, when the sun goes down, it's not evening, it's the next day. And so evening starts 3 in the afternoon. So this incident actually takes place during a set time of prayer, third hour of prayer, which was also the time of the evening sacrifice. It is always good to pray, right? And good things always happen when you pray. It is also good to have some set times of prayer to make sure that you remember to pray so that those good things can happen. And that's what we have here. They're going up to the temple to pray, and good stuff's going to happen. They meet this beggar. Now, this man was crippled from birth. Literally, it says, from his mother's womb. Okay? So, so this, this man, he had never walked. He'd never used his legs to run or jump or play. From, a, from an infant to a childhood to adulthood, he had to be carried from one place to another. And he was brought to the temple at this specific time, not so much to join the others in prayer, uh, but rather to take advantage of what we might call rush hour, right? You know, this was the time when you'd have a lot of people coming and going for the evening prayer and sacrifice, and so that makes this prime time for begging. And when I was in college, one of the ways I'd try to get some spare uh, change and money is I'd go into the, the Boston subways with my guitar or some of my banjo. Banjo actually made more money. But uh, and I opened up the case, and uh, it's just start playing. People throw money into the case. It was so much fun. You know when I went? Morning rush hour or evening rush hour. Why? Because if you go in the middle of the day, nobody there. You don't make any money. You go when the people are coming and going. Same thing here. Luke tells us he was carried every day to the temple, and specifically to the temple gate called Beautiful, the Beautiful Gate. We're not sure exactly which gate this was, but it was most likely uh, what is known as the Nicanor Gate. This was located at the main eastern entrance to the temple. There were 10 gates in the temple. They stood between the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles could go, and then the inner courts, where only the Jewish people could go. This particular gate, the gate of Nicanor, was 75 feet high, so yeah, easily as high as our ceiling there. That's a pretty big gate. Uh, it had huge double doors made of Corinthian bronze. It took 20 men to close it at night. And the historian Josephus describes it as the most beautiful of all the gates. All the other gates were, were sort of overlaid with a, a thin layer of silver and gold. Remember that, because we're going to come up to silver and gold in a minute. Uh, but this one was just pure bronze all the way through, and it was just beautiful. So this was most likely the beautiful gate. Every day, this man was put here to beg from those going into the temple courts, but he was not allowed to enter himself. Not only were the Gentiles not allowed to enter, he wasn't a Gentile, we'll find out later, he was a Jewish man, but no crippled, lame, or blind were permitted to pass through the gate to the inner courts. So this man had really had three huge needs here, right? He, he had a long-standing condition from birth. He was utterly dependent on other people, and he had no means of subsistence. He had to beg for money in order to live. And the beggar's physical condition here in Acts mirrors our spiritual 
condition before we came to Christ. Why? Because we're all crippled by sin from birth. We're, we're, we're born into our sin condition and we are helpless to change ourselves. We too are completely dependent on another. Only God can save us from our sinful condition. And outside of Christ, we are all spiritual beggars. And all we can do is throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And that leads us into the only source of help, our second point in your outline, the only source of help. Too often, like, like the beggar here in Acts 3, we find ourselves looking in all the wrong places, all the wrong places for help. Look at verses 3, and f- three through 5 next. When he, the beggar, saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So when the beggar sees Peter and John, asks them for money. He's asking everybody. Everyone's coming in. Can I have some money? Can I have some money? And Peter and John look straight at him. Peter gets his attention. Look at us. Look at me. This is significant because most people probably ignored the beggar, right? They saw him there every day. Not again. Most people certainly avoided eye contact, right? You see this all the time at traffic lights. Uh, In our time, when people are asking for money, you look at the people in the cars. They're all just looking straight forward, right? They're trying to avoid eye contact. Why? Because maybe they're a little embarrassed, a little uncomfortable. They're trying to avoid a connection. So when Peter says, look at us, this definitely got the beggar's attention. It's sort of like rolling down your window at the traffic light, right? Honking your horn and saying, come here, come here. They're going to come running. They're going to be right there for you. So, of course, this man gave them his attention. He was expecting to get something. He was expecting to get some money from them. And this is a classic example of looking in all the wrong places because this man needed far more than monetary assistance. Yes, he needed money to get by, but what he really needed was physical healing, and even more importantly, he needed spiritual healing. And we often look to the wrong things in life for help, and we neglect the most important things that we need. Yes, money is important, but if you are looking for money to fill all your other needs, then like the beggar, you are looking in all the wrong places. Now, Peter and John, they didn't have a lot of money anyways, right? But they gave him what they had, which turned out uh, was far better. Because uh, what the be- beggar actually needed was not money. Look at verses 6 through 8. Now, I'll read it this time. I won't sing it. You can sing it later on your own. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Peter says, hey, I don't have silver and gold, don't have that, but I'll give you what I got. Now, I'm sure this man wasn't expecting silver or gold anyways, right? He's probably hoping for just a few coins, a couple copper coins, but Peter Mentioned silver and gold for a number of reasons. First of all, once again, he may have been referencing the beautiful gate. We talked about that, right? This was the one gate that was not overlaid with silver and gold. And so, you know, Peter may have just point up at the gate and said, hey, I don't have any silver or gold, just like this gate doesn't have silver or gold. But also, I think Peter wanted to emphasize the value of what he was about to give. By starting with silver and gold, okay, that immediately raises this man's expectations. You're going to give me something even more valuable than silver or gold? And then Peter continues, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, rise up and walk. Now, the beggar was definitely 
not expecting this. I want you to notice some of the key phrases uh, that Peter uses here. He begins with the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Remember in the Gospels, when Jesus healed, he did it in his own power. But the apostles, when they healed, they healed in Jesus' name. They had no power in and of themselves. They healed in the name of Jesus. Remember what we said in week one of our series. We sometimes call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles. But it's not the Acts of the Apostles. Right? It's the Holy Spirit. Uh, But it's not even that. It's not even the Acts of the Holy Spirit working through the Apostles. No, these are the Acts of Jesus through the Holy Spirit working in the apostles. This is what Jesus continued to do after he ascended to heaven. Why does Peter begin in the name of Jesus? Because Jesus alone has the power to heal. Yes, he ascended to heaven, but he was still present with the power to heal through his designated apostles. Peter begins with the name Jesus, and then he adds the title Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. And the word Christ means Messiah. Now at this point, where are the believers? They're still in Jerusalem. They're doing what Jesus said. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then they're going to move out, right? They're in Jerusalem. They're bringing the gospel to their fellow Jews. And so the title of of Christ or Messiah is especially important. And then Peter also mentions Nazareth, Jesus' hometown where he grew up. Notice something else here. Peter does not merely pray for healing. Okay, this was not a prayer for healing like we do today. This was a direct command. As an apostle of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do signs and wonders, Peter commands the healing, and it is done. Peter takes him by the right hand. He helps him up. This is an example of physical touch in order to aid faith. Jesus did this a lot. When he healed in the Gospels, Jesus often laid on hands. He used physical touch when healing people. And when Peter takes the man's hand, the man's feet and ankles instantly become strong. Jesus not only heals the underlying issue, but he grants instant strength to the man's atrophied muscles, muscles which he had never used in his entire life. No physical therapy needed. Oh, where do I sign up for that one, Lord, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Instant healing, no physical therapy needed. The man jumps to his feet, and he starts walking. Can you imagine trying out your new legs after never never having walked in your whole life? Your whole life, you've always been carried everywhere, completely dependent on others, and now you are walking on your own. And then Luke tells us the beggar walked with the disciples through the gate into the temple courts. Remember, he has never been allowed inside before. First time in the temple. And he walks in on his own two legs. But this man's not just walking, right? He goes into the temple courts walking and leaping and praising God. It's an awesome scene. Walking was not enough. He was unable to contain his joy. And he's just jumping and he's leaping around as he praises God for this wonderful miracle. This is a beautiful moment that takes place at the beautiful gate. The man is physically healed in the name of Jesus, and now for the first time in his life, he is permitted entrance into the temple to worship God with his people. Something else here, the word that's translated leaping here, very rare word, uh, very rarely used in scripture. You know one place where it is used? In a prophecy from Isaiah about the Messiah, Isaiah 35, 6, which says that when the Messiah comes, the lame will leap like a deer. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is another confirmation that Jesus indeed is the Christ, that he is the promised Messiah who was to come. 
amazing miracle. Remember, this man was crippled from birth, from his mother's womb. I mean, it's one thing to recover from an accident. But to be healed when you've been lame from birth, that is an astounding miracle. The story is told of Thomas Aquinas. He lived in the uh, 1200s. Uh, walking in on Pope Innocent II when uh, the Pope was uh, counting out a large sum of money. The, uh, the church was a little wealthier uh, in those days. And, and uh, the Pope kind of rubbed it in. He said, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. I've got it all. That's true, Holy Father, replied Thomas. But neither can she now say, rise up and walk. You see, the beggar at the beautiful gate asked for money, but he got so much more. And the people in the temple that day, boy, they took notice. They took notice. Look at verses 9 and 10. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The people see, the, see him walking around the temple, praising God, caused a commotion. They, they all come over to see what's going on, and they recognize him. Of course they do. They see him every day, every day for years. They've seen him begging at the temple gate, but now he's inside the temple. He's walking. He's leaping. He's praising God. They know who he was before, and they are amazed at the difference. When you come to Christ, especially later in life, people know who you were before, right? They know your old patterns and habits. They know what you used to talk about. They know what kind of language that you used. They know what used to be the most important things to you. But you see, when you become a Christian, everything changes. It all changes. You're a new creation in Christ. You have new goals and priorities in life. And, you know, you may not be walking around the office jumping up and down and, and causing a commotion, but there should be noticeable changes in your life. You begin to grow in your faith. Your character changes. You become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful. You become vocal about your faith. See, people know who you were before you came to Christ. Now that you're a Christian, may they be amazed at the difference. This is part of your witness for Christ. I'd like to close with three applications from our passage today that directly apply to us in our lives today. First of all, God still heals in answer to prayer, okay? Okay. This isn't just something from back then. God still heals in answer to prayer. Now, we do not command people to be healed like the apostles did, okay? Remember, the signs and wonders, that was God's way of authenticating the apostles and their message. So we don't command, but God still heals today in answer to prayer. So this is another example. Once again, you gotta, we need to be careful that we don't build doctrines out of unique historical events. Just because the apostles commanded people to be healed doesn't mean that you and I can command people to be healed. The apostles also wrote Scripture, right? We can't write Scripture. And so we interpret the narrative sections of Scripture using the teaching sections of Scripture. What do the teaching sections tell us? They tell us to pray. Nowhere in the teaching sections of Scripture are we ever told that we can command people to be healed. Never are we told, command someone and they will be healed. Rather, we are instructed to pray for people to be healed. James 5 says, if any of you is sick, go to the elders of your church and they will pray over you. And the prayer of faith will make you well. They'll anoint you with oil. They'll pray for you. We're told to pray for people to be healed. Physical and spiritual healing comes only through Jesus Christ. And so we should be praying for healing in Jesus' name. If you're sick, if there's someone in your family is sick, pray for them in Jesus' name. We've seen so many times God has healed in this church. Rosie and I can testify in our family. 
God is so good. So application number one, yes, God still heals today in answer to prayer. Second application, give people what you have, right? And one thing we all have as Christians is Jesus and the gospel. We all have that. You know, the beggar at the gate, he thought money was his greatest need, but God knew better. And you may or may not have silver and gold to share. But either way, you have something much better than silver or gold. And we should always be willing to help others whenever we can. If God's blessed you financially, help people financially. But the best thing any of us can ever do for anyone is offer them Jesus and the gospel. And then finally, our third application is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, let your light shine. You're the light of the world. Let your light shine. May people be amazed at the difference Jesus makes in your life. You know, the lame beggar sat by the beautiful gate for years, but never entered through. It was not until someone shared Jesus with him that he was physically and spiritually healed. You are spiritually lame and helpless apart from Christ. You have been since birth. Many of us have sat outside the gate all our lives. And like the beggar who was not permitted to enter the temple, we were lost in our sins and outside of Christ. But there is still healing at the gate today. Jesus is the true, beautiful gate. He is the doorway to salvation. And there is healing and salvation and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. And so this morning I say to you what Peter said to the lame man in Acts, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Enter through the beautiful gate. Enter through Jesus and enjoy the blessings of God's salvation and favor. Let us pray. Oh, dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful passage of Scripture. We thank you for this beautiful thing you did in this man's life right there at the beautiful gate. Lord Jesus, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. You are the beautiful gate. We want to enter through you. And when we do, we, we find that there is healing in Jesus' name. We find that you make the difference in our lives that will shine out to others. That they may ask us, what's so different about you? And then we can offer them the greatest gift of all. We can offer them Jesus and the gospel. That their lives may be changed just as radically and dramatically as this man at the beautiful gate in Acts. Thank you for your word, Lord. Apply it to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, following our closing song today, uh, as usual, we, uh, we uh, often have uh, some leaders in the church up front. If you need prayer this morning, uh, if you need prayer for anything, uh, you know, the financial, or you want to pray to receive Jesus as your Savior. But we're also going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, Pastor Dan and I are going to be standing over here to the side uh, as elders of the church. Uh, and as we said, the book of James, it says, if, if, if any one of you is sick, go to the elders of your church. Ask them to pray for you. I have a little vial of oil. And following scripture, we will pray for you in the name of Jesus, anointing you with oil and asking God to do his healing work for you. So I won't be out there greeting people today uh, as usual. Pastor Dan and I will be down front. But if you have sickness, if you have illness, if you have any prayer need, come forward. But if it's prayer for healing, uh, come to the elders of your church that we may pray for you. Let's stand together as we close in song.
in the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in His grace and be blessed. And those of you who would like prayer this morning, please come forward, uh, either for whatever needs you have here in the center, or for prayer for healing, please meet Pastor Dan and I over to the side. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.